You know, time is one of those things that's a bit funny to sit there and try and think about. The fact of the matter is that everything and everyone has a past, a present, and a future. And this isn't meant to be any sort of grammar lesson or anything like that, but our ancient word of the day, salvation, follows that same pattern. It has a past tense, a present tense, and a future tense. You see, we have been saved, we are being saved, and yes, we will be saved. I've been doing an awful lot of thinking about time lately. Maybe it was being right here with you in January and talking about beginnings and endings. Maybe it's becoming a father or something like that, but I think there is something a little bit deeper going on. It feels as though our world is at a crossroads, and the decisions that we make right now, here in the present, will impact our future. We face questions like whether we should go to the left or to the right, whether we should stay the course or lean into a progressive mentality. Should we absolve tradition and embrace modernity or not? You see, I've been doing a lot of thinking about the past, the present, and the future. Just this past week, even, I was driving here to teach a profession of faith class, and oh, the weather was just warm enough to have my window down. And as I drove along, my favorite song was playing on the radio. Never gonna give you up, never gonna let you down, never gonna run around and desert you. As the window was rolled down and my favorite song was on the radio, I began to think about the present. I thought of how right now I seem to be in this season with my family where we have things that we spend so long praying for. We're in this season where we can just feel the faithfulness of God, that God has brought us out of such darkness and into light. We, we are now in a place where we have the incredible opportunity to walk alongside your kids and your grandkids, to build lives, to build into their lives, and to be that influence that we needed when we were teenagers, but we didn't have. God is so good. As I drove along that night with my window rolled down and my favorite song on the radio, my mind also then turned to the past. I thought of how just over a year, or just under a year ago, Ashley and I came here to Clarington, to Bowmanville, and there was so much uncertainty on our minds. We had questions on our mind like, are we good enough? God, did you really call us here? Won't you equip us for the work that is to be done? In our first few weeks here at youth group, we were blessed to see several, li- uh, several kids give their lives to Christ. And this isn't an opportunity to brag or to boast. This isn't because of some special preaching or great worship or really fun games. No, the Spirit of God has been at work in these kids' lives far before me or Ashley ever got here. But for us, it served as a powerful confirmation, a reminder that God had indeed called us here for a purpose. It lit this fire under Ashley and I and the rest of our youth leaders that there is a burden on our hearts to work and to join alongside of you in praying that God would transform our community and our kids' lives through the power of the gospel. As I drove along with the window down and my favorite song on the radio, my mind also began to think of the future. I thought of how there is this burning desire. There is this expectation and hope that God will pour out his spirit in a powerful way and that he will move here in our community. Over the past couple of years at Bible College, I've had the opportunity to learn about many words Some of them ancient and some of them have been modern, but today we talk about salvation. What does it mean to be saved? What am I saved from? What are we saved to? You see, we pray for salvation. We want to see it happen in our workplaces and in our schools, in our friend groups and with those we know. But what does it really mean to be saved? How are we saved? 
I'll bet that if I asked many of us to find gospel, to find good news in our Bibles, we would rightfully turn to Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. And rightfully so, because these chronicle the accounts of Jesus' life. The good news can be found there, yes. But the good news begins far before that. I want to take a few moments and go back, almost all the way back to the beginning, to Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. It reads, So the Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity, another way of saying that is I will put hostility between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. You see, we find ourselves in our text today, in a place of death. Humanity has sinned. They have disobeyed against God, and they have marred his perfect creation forever with the decaying effects of sin. You see, sin has entered the world, and with sin comes a series of problems. Sin, first and foremost, separates us from God. God stands righteous and holy and just. And there is an expanse now between a sinful and fallen humanity. But sin also has a decaying effect. Sin corrodes everything it touches. And every facet of the human experience will eventually become marked by sin. And for that, for introducing this terrible problem of sin, there's got to be consequences. And today, we find find God introducing some of those consequences. God begins with the serpent, and he says, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. For sin, there must be consequences, and the consequences also apply to humanity. We don't have to look very far to see the consequence of sin in our world today. Because of sin, humanity will experience physical and spiritual death, separation from God. They will endure things like pain in childbirth and in work. Yet here, in the Garden of Eden, a humanity fallen, here in this place of death, we find life. And this life, it comes in the form of a promise. The promise is for salvation. God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. This verse has one of those fancy Bible college names, and I'm not sure if it is ancient or it is modern, but it comes from two words. Proto, meaning first, as in prototype, is the first type of something, and it comes from another Greek word called euangelizo. You, you, I gotta go with those $10 words. <clears throat> it is the first promise of good news in the Bible. You see, in spite of us being born under the curse of sin, which separates us from God, in spite of this terrible mistake that we've made, God will save humanity from sin and its consequences. And this This is what salvation means, to be delivered from sin completely and all of its consequences. God promises to put enmity or hostility between the offspring of the woman and the serpent. And the rest of the biblical narrative is essentially the outplaying of this promise. Right In Genesis chapter 1 to Genesis chapter 11, uh, we see humanity on a grand scale. We have stories about the flood and the Tower of Babel, and they all point us to this one truth, that humanity has fallen, and we are in need of a Savior. The rest of the biblical narrative then focuses on one man, Abraham and his family, a man by which the seed of the woman will come to crush the head of the serpent. We understand this promise to ultimately be about Jesus. On the cross, the serpent bruised the heel, bruised his heel. But what Satan didn't realize that in 3 days Christ would rise and conquer the conquer the grave. In doing so, Jesus saves believers from our sin and its consequences. 
it is through his sacrifice that we are given salvation. This salvation works itself out in our lives in three tenses, in three ways. We have been saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. So then, what does it mean to have been saved? You see, the cross answers this great problem that is posed to us in Scripture. We are born with hostility between us and God. There is this expanse, this distance between us, and we are guilty. We ought to pay the penalty for our sins. Yet, God, in his infinite love and mercy, declares us innocent in his sight. We are given the very righteousness of Christ. The one thing that we need for eternal harmony with God is given freely unto us through faith. And you see, Jesus was the only one who could pay this penalty. Jesus was fully man and fully God. Because he was fully man, it means that his sacrifice was then applicable to us. He wasn't someone who was alien to the human experience. He wasn't some outsider, no. He was one of us, and he died in our place. Because he is fully God, it means that his sacrifice was sufficient to cover everyone's sins, all believers. Paul talks about this in Romans 4, verse 5. He writes, To the one who does not work, but trusts God who who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. You see, it is through faith and through faith alone in Christ, by God's good grace, that we are adopted into his family. And although the sacrifice of Christ was the moment when your adoption papers were signed and sealed, God's plan to call you his own begins far before that. In fact, it begins before he laid the foundations of the world, the Apostle Paul says, Before he called forth galaxies and brought together mountains, before he created the creatures of the deep and formed the mountains, before a single ounce of cosmic space dust came into being, God said, you, yes you, you are my child. I have engraved your name on the palm of my hands. I know each and every hair that will ever be on your head. I know each thought that you will ever think, and I know every breath that you will ever think, God says, and you, yes, you are mine. Jesus echoes this in John 6, verse 39, saying, and this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those who he has given to me. What Jesus is saying here. Jesus is saying, I have bought you at a great price. I will not lose you, says Christ. My blood does not shed needlessly, Jesus says. It is priceless, and it was shed for you. It is finished. Three words that change the eternity of all believers. The serpent must have thought that this was it. The king of the universe, dead on a cross, Yet in those three words, it is finished. And all that they mean, we find life in a place of death. Not only have we been saved, but we continue to be saved. And let me make one thing perfectly clear. What I am not saying is that we are continually in need of salvation insofar as it relates to God's um, declaring us righteous in his sight. Right, God bought you at a price. You are signed and sealed in the blood of the Lamb and given the Spirit as the mark of your inheritance. You are His. Rather, what I am saying is that we continue to experience deliverance from sin and death throughout our lives. We call this the idea of sanctification, and there's another one of those words, that we are being made holy. We are being made more like Jesus throughout our lives. God's spirit works at us in such a way that he works to lead us and guide us and convict us of our sins so that we can eventually become more like Christ. The Israelites were no strangers to this idea of needing to be saved. 
If you read the Old Testament, one of the takeaways that you pretty much have to come away with is that the Israelites are constantly making a mess of things. Things like sexual immorality, complaining, grumbling, and worshiping the idols of their neighbors. Exodus 17 is no different. The Israelites were complaining because there was no water. They were wandering around in the desert, and they began to complain. They must have been panicked, seeing, hey, there's no water. They turn to Moses and say, Moses, what are you going to do about this? And Moses turns to God and he asks God. And God says, Moses, go and hit a rock with your staff. And there, in the middle of the wilderness, in the place where you least expect it, comes forth life in a place of death. You see, sin has more consequences in our lives than just death and separation from God. Sin causes humans to have an inability to empathize, an inability to properly love, and to reject authority and be self-centered. We can see this clearly being played out in our world. Sin's decaying effects continue to erode our world and corrupt every facet of the human experience. Think about things like war and climate change and the general state of our society today. The church also faces some major obstacles. Working with young people, one of the things that is on my mind is is this issue of young people and the church. I was reading a pre-pandemic study that said uh, two-thirds of young people aged 18 to 22 leave the church for at least a year. I'm often left wondering, what is going on? You see, I've been reading and I've been researching. I've been studying sociology and ecclesiologies and I've been talking to many young people to try to get a better handle on what is going on. I've thought that maybe if we get better games for youth group, maybe if we have better lighting, maybe we need a full band every week or more TVs in our buildings. Maybe if the preaching is more energetic on Wednesdays, or maybe, maybe if we have more snacks, then they'll stay. In spite of all of this noise, in spite of everything that is going on in our world today, I'm reminded again and again that God has not lost a generation, and he won't start now. He has always preserved a remnant, a faithful following of his people, and he won't lose today's generation. There's good news. In our post-pandemic world, in spite of all of the troubles that seem to be going on, according to this US study I read of over 2,000 people, 73% of Gen Z teens, that's those aged 13 to 21, 73% of them desire to grow spiritually. Can you believe that? 73% of young people want to grow in some sort of faith. God has prepared for us a mission field right in front of our eyes. It's not some distant, far-off land. You don't need any sort of special training or to board an airplane to get there. No, God has prepared a mission field for us right here. And you know where it is? It's high school hallways that are filled with vape smoke. It's soccer fields and it's dollar stores. It's those rambunctious kids who are walking down your street, and it's the ones here with us in our pews. And you know what? 73% of teens don't need you to be able to perfectly articulate your faith and all of its doctrines. 73% of teens don't need you to have everything all figured out. The report didn't say that 73% of Gen Z teens want you to have a perfect ability to defend your faith against all of the social pressures. You see, our doctrinal positions and our dogma are not what the next generation of unbelievers are hungry for. More than half of all teens specifically surveyed want to learn more about Jesus. I'm convinced. I am convinced that God is doing something special here. There has been an inexplicable sense of God's presence right here in our community. I could tell you stories about kids who have never been to church before, never grown up in anything, who are hungry for the gospel, 
They know that there is something more to this world than this present reality that they are facing. God is up to something. There is something brewing with this generation. God is calling Gen Z, our teenagers and our young adults, back to himself. And I truly believe that God is saving this generation. God is at work. And we need to go and make disciples. You see, God is saving us. And he will be faithful in keeping his promises. This I am convinced of, that he will rescue us, and yes, he will restore creation to its intended state. God is faithful, and he will save us. These three youth that you saw profess their faith today, they are here as a testimony that God is a faithful God, that he doesn't lose what is his. He has set them apart as his own, He has provided for them and guided them as they walk in the path of the righteous. He has kept them from the company of sinners, and he has made them like trees trees planted by streams of water. He has given them all that they are in need of, but I'll bet if you asked any of them, they would tell you, it hasn't always been easy. The ways of this world are especially enticing for a young person, but God has been faithful, and he will continue to be faithful. God's spirit has been at work in their lives, and he will continue to work throughout the rest of their lives, leading, guiding, and equipping them for maturity in Christ, and that is what we are here to celebrate today. Not only have we been saved, but we are being saved, and yes, we will be saved Christ will return. He will establish a new kingdom, one that is free from this decaying effect of sin. We will be glorified. We will be saved from sin and its effects completely. Christ will come to judge the living and the dead. And for now, we find ourselves in the space between the already and the not yet, in the space between the inauguration of the kingdom of God on the cross at Calvary and the consummation of all that it means at Christ's return. And while we find ourselves in the space between, there is work to be done. We must be emboldened to witness the good news to others. We must continue to bring life to places where there has only been death before. We must first know life. We have already established then that there is a biblical pattern of finding life in places where there ought to only be death. You see, we serve a God who invites us into this wonderful transformation of death becoming life. Maybe you've been listening to all that has been said here and you can clearly point to that spot in your life, that place that feels dead. Maybe you feel stuck in the past. Maybe those mistakes that you once made, they just keep playing in your head over and over like a loop. Maybe you find yourself lamenting your present condition. Maybe life just doesn't seem to be all that it's meant to be. Maybe that hope that you once had for the future, it just feels dead. I have good news. We have good news. We serve a God who brings life out of places of death. Maybe it's a relative that you've been praying for for years and years. Maybe you want to see them put their faith in Christ. Maybe it feels like that thing, that place just feels dead. But we serve a God who brings life out of places of death. I don't know what your situation is. I don't know how long you've been wanting to be free. I don't have the answer why this has or has not happened yet. This I do know, that God is able. He can bring about life in the bleakest of situations, in those times where you don't expect it at all. I once experienced a time like that. It didn't start as one of those deep, dark, depressed places, though. In fact, it started pretty good. 
because my life changed forever the day that I met her. At the time, I thought she was the love of my life. I met her completely through chance, too. I was hanging out with some friends in a garage, and I looked up, and there she was. <clears throat> boy, oh boy, did she get my heart racing, too. From the day that I met her, everything, it just changed. Her name, her name was Cocaine. After that day, me and Cocaine, we were inseparable. I was hooked. Every day for a year, I couldn't get enough. I lied, I stole, I cheated, and I was expelled from high school. I guess you could say we had a toxic relationship, but every day we were together. We got into an awful lot of trouble together. Who would have thought that a year-long binge would destroy my mental health? I became a regular at, a psych, at the psych ward and found myself in jail more than a few times. I don't remember a lot of those times, but I do remember the last time. I remember feeling the cuffs digging into my wrist as I rolled along in the back of the cop car. I remember the guards searching me and taking my fingerprints. I remember being led down a long co uh, concrete hallway with a myriad of doors on each side. The fluorescent lights buzzed above my head when we finally arrived at my home for the night, my cell. By the time I walked into that cell, I was beginning to come crashing down. The effects of the drugs were wearing off, and I was beginning to withdraw. The feelings of hopelessness came crashing in. I'd been here before, a bunch of times, and nothing should have been any different about this time, except for some reason, everything was. As I looked around that dark, dingy, concrete cell, I cried out in frustration. What are you doing, Ryan? You're wasting everything. You're gonna die soon. I couldn't just stop, though. I mean, if I wasn't getting high, well then, what, what would I do? Who would I be? If there wasn't the high to live for, then well, what was there even to live for? I couldn't do it by myself. I tried before. Finally, perhaps out of desperation or being out of options, maybe it was fear, I don't really know. In that still, small, quiet voice of my head, I prayed, God, if you're real, Save me from myself. Took me a few more rock bottom moments, a couple of sinner's prayers, and 16 months in rehab, but God did save me from myself. There, in that dark, dingy, cold jail cell, life in a place of death. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, we celebrate the fact that you are a God who brings life out of places of death. But we recognize the tension that there is, Lord. And we wonder, why not yet? Why not now? Why hasn't it happened? And God, we don't know all the answers to these questions. But this we do know, that you are faithful and you are able. In moments of doubt, in moments where we can't see the future, Lord, that you have for us, would you lead us, would you guide us, and would you protect us, we pray. Amen.